Good afternoon, and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studio Online Lunchtime Talk. These are live every Friday at 1 p.m., beaming out onto your smartphones, laptops, iPads, and living room televisions. My name is Martin O'Leary, and I'm the Pervasive Media Studio's creative technologist. These talks are our chance to throw open the digital doors of the Pervasive Media Studio and for you to hear more from the people who are part of our community or who are working on things that excite us. And especially big welcome to those of you who are new to the studio, for whom this may be the first time you're engaging with us. For all of you newcomers, here's a little bit about what we do. The Pervasive Media Studio is a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology, exploring everything from comedy to coding, product development, performance art. We're a partnership between Watershed, the University of the West of England, and the University of Bristol. We're a home for early ideas, for companies, and a meeting place of both creative and commercial industry. We're a studio space. It offers desk space, meeting rooms, events, and opportunities, all for free for our residents. And we're a safe space for artists to take risks in their practice and make time for collaboration. This week's talk is called Rabbit Holes. It's by Penny Hay, Ian Forrester, and James Cook. They'll be talking about adaptive podcasting, what it is, and how it might shape the future of listening. They'll explain the technology and talk about the creative challenges that it offers. And they'll talk about the project they're working on to connect young audiences to the digital world. There'll be a Q&A at the end with the talk running at about 35 minutes. If you want to ask any questions, just stick them in the chat window and I'll pick them out to ask the speaker. Uh, a captioned version of this talk will be available here after the talk is finished. Uh, before we start, next week's talk is part of our future theme season. Recently, the studio funded several residents and their collaborators to convene deep conversations about art, technology, and society. Conversations that are both help hopeful and critically engaged. From now until early January, there will be talks focusing on what has emerged from those conversations. Full details of all of those projects are live on our website. Next week's talk is Jane Gauntlet. Uh, it's called Past, Present, and Future Pleasures. Jane is a writer for film and theatre, and she's collaborating with Cindy Gallup, Ama Josephine Budge, Sarah Birdgirl, and Rob Eagle on It's Our Pleasure, a multidisciplinary experience of pleasure, community, diversity, activism, and exploration. You can get news on all of our future talks by following us on at PM Studio UK on Twitter or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or by subscribing to our newsletter on our website. Don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel and give the video a thumbs up. It really does help. The more subscribers we get, the more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. And please feel free to share this link now. We're live any of your socials. But for now, I'm going to hand over to the Rabbit Holes team. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Penny Hay. I'm reader in creative teaching and learning and research fellow at Bar Spar University and also director of research for a charity now called House of Imagination. It used to be called 555, five. I'll tell you more later. I'll hand over now to Ian. Hi, I'm Ian Forrester and I work for BBC r and I'm the senior fire starter there and I've been working on this project called uh, Adaptive Podcasting for a while. James Cook. Uh, I'm a producer and editor at the BBC, so I'm, I make programmes. Uh, I mainly make programmes about natural history, but not exclusively, and I look after quite a lot of podcasts, and I work for a small organisation called the Creative Development Unit, who are charged with kind of innovative forms of, uh, of radio and podcast making. Brilliant. Thanks, James. And many of our Rabbit Holes team, I think, are in the audience, so I hope they're going to interact with uh, lots of brilliant questions. So just to set the context for the project, um, so as uh, Director of Research for the Charity, House of Imagination, we are an expanded performance partner in the, we're an industry port partner in the expanded performance part of the Bristol and Bath Creative R&D, that's a mouthful. Um, so out of the opportunity to do some kind of deep research and inquiry of the past four months, the seeds of the idea for Rabbit Hole was sown when I met Ian um, and we were engaged in a kind of conversation about the power of the imagination and I wanted to invite young people to fall down a metaphorical rabbit hole and connect more deeply with nature and creativity. So Ian immediately introduced me to James, who has an interest in it. Well, I think he said something like, I mentioned you in rabbit holes, and let's say I just had to connect you both. So we discussed the notion of rabbit holes as a universe of possibility, a constellation of ideas with young people, well, everyone, following their fascinations through self-directed inquiry. So that was the focus of my PhD, really. 
and, and a focus on entanglement and rhizomatic learning with a deep sense of being connected to the natural world. So over to you, um, Ian and James. Okay, so we should we um, talk through the technology? Yeah, so maybe I should start by saying um, through this moment of serendipity, we the, the Rabbit Holes group was formed and we've, we've involved a lot of artists from the Expanded Performance cohort, but also other artists who are interested in this aspect, including Kathy Hine, Rich Turnbull. Um, have a look at the um, blog that I've written. Um, so yeah, ha have, hand over to you now, Ian. Okay, so um, if I switch. Okay, so um, I've, yeah, I've been working at R&D for a while um, and been really interested in um, a thing we call the community of practice and and basically building tools to encourage people to to explore their creativity. So this is kind of where the kind of the connection kind of came. So we work on this thing called adaptive podcasting. It used to call perceptive podcast. So if you look for it, you might find it. But let me explain kind of how the technology works, and then we can then go into more of the creative uh, aspects of it. So um, most people are familiar with podcasting through um, now through their phone. They're using a lot of these kind of apps to um, to listen to podcasts. Um, yeah, podcast has been around since 2001, and I, I was uh, fortunate to be involved um, back then, uh, which is, it was quite different then. But this is how most people listen to podcasts right now. And it's, it's big, and it's growing, and that's the interesting thing. The, the interesting thing for, for, say, for example, for the BBC is that the, the numbers around uh, younger people are definitely growing and growing all the time. And you're starting to see certain genres kind of coming together. The The thing that's also interesting is that back in 2001, we were listening to podcasts on stuff like the iPod, MP3 players, stuff like that. And over time, that's changed uh, as a smartphone has become um, it's just everywhere everyone has a smartphone or a lot of people have most people have smartphones um, and you're starting to see that people are listening to podcasts on smartphones but smartphones are smarter than that and it, we kind of moved from players like um, iPods and MP3s to to smartphones and all the smartphone really is doing is just playing back audio it could do so much more also the media has much more potential so we've been working in R&D on this thing called object-based media for a long while. I won't go into detail, but if you imagine traditional media, what we do is we kind of shape it all together, bundle it all together, make it into a final thing, and that gets kind of sent out as the very final thing. Um, so you, what we send out is what you hear or what you listen to or what you, um, you know, um, watch. And with object-based media is instead of bundling it all together and then um, kind of sending out the final version, what we're doing is we're sending out the, the assets or the, as we call them, objects. And that's then rearranged and changed based on what device you're listening to or what device you're using to, to listen or watch it back on. I like to use it a slight, I'd like to explain it in a slightly different way. And uh, this is actually from the next web. Um, but it's kind of the same principle, and they call it software to remix. And I think that's, that's quite interesting. And I think this is kind of where we're, we're heading with some of the, um, the adaptive media stuff. So I like to describe it as, and I know some of my colleagues don't like it, but I'm going to use it anyway. I like to think of media as like Lego bricks. And these Lego bricks, um, you can see there's four Lego bricks. They're different colors, they're different shapes. Um, and you can see that, um, if you put all four together, then they probably would stand up. Now that is just defined because of the metadata. The metadata is the stuff that is the stuff that we see, but we don't really think about. You know, it allows you to describe what that brick is or what that that piece of media is, and and some of the um, the aspects of it. And if you have enough metadata. Um, and you could then describe that to a machine, for example, 
or to a piece of software. So when you're doing your software remixing, then you can do more. With enough of these objects, you can make a story or make a narrative or make other types of things. So you can start to piece them together. So if you use the Lego method, um, the Lego uh, analogy I'm using, then you can make out of the same bucket of Lego bricks, you can make a story about a house or about a car or about anything you wanted. And you can rearrange those objects or the Legos to make that. The other thing that we're really interested in is we're looking at two types of interactions. Um, we're looking at responsive, which is very much um, explicit interaction. So you say, I want to do this, and it takes you in that direction. Or you press a button, and it takes you in that direction. The other side is the perceptive. And um, what that is, is it's using implicit interaction. So you're in a certain area. You happen to be looking down. So for example, one of the scenarios we talked about was you stand still, you reach down uh, to pick up a leaf uh, or you look up to, to do something and the, um, the media would change or adapt because of that. And that feels like a much more natural um, thing that would work for, for podcasting. So we created this thing called Perceptive Radio um, which is based off that perceptive um, media approach. And so this radio is a physical radio. It plays back object-based media, but also it has sensors on it. So the sensor on the front, which knows how close you are. It has a light sensor on the, on the top and it has a microphone. Um, now bear in mind, this is 2013. So um, this is just around the same time as the Alexa, um, but this does not understand what speech is. It just knows noise level. So a scenario we had was that if, you, if you're playing a play and then there's a loud noise in the room, then it could pause. But because it's object-based media, it could do better than that. What we could do is we could do something where it stops the dialogue, but keeps the background music um, on, but quietly on a loop in the background. It's those kind of scenarios that you can do when you have, um, when you take object-based media um, and you can take um, devices which are smarter or are using sensors and data. So the, the thing is that that sounds, that sounds quite magical. Um, and it, you, know, you can imagine, and um, there's other scenarios that we have, which are where it's very immersive, um, but it's not just technical. There's, there's a critical thing about storytelling, uh, which needs to be thought about and um, before it could really be you know, immersive. It's no good having just the technology. It's the kind of the end point of, of what I'm trying to say. This also is for us a new medium and there are new rules. And this is something that we don't know what those rules are. And we would want to, ex we want to explore what those rules are, not just within the BBC, but we want to do it as a community, as a community practice. And this is where the rabbit holes uh, works comes really nicely into sharp focus. Um, I know one of the things that me and Penny and James talked about was um, this, this notion of oral storytelling. And I think a lot of what um, I'm very focused on is that we've kind of made this jump from the published words to um, broadcast um, into digital, but we've kind of ignored the the oral storytelling element, and um, it's so core to what we do. So, um, so I'll use this example. Um, so, oral storytelling has been there for forever, and it's kind of very core to the storytelling, and it's really important. Um, and I, I think with some of the technology we're talking about, we we can get closer to oral storytelling than where we were with broadcasting and the written word. So we can also, you know, send it to lots of people, but they also have more of a kind of storytelling, you know, around the campfire kind of um, uh, experience or an immersive experience. So ultimately we want to reinvent podcasting. Um, and, you know, there's ways that we can do that. And this is how we're approaching it. We're obviously going to do it on smartphones because smartphones are so dominant and the podcasting has moved towards that. 
the smartphones is very powerful and they're they're always on and they have loads and loads of sensors so we're calling it adaptive podcasting as i said before there's loads and loads of sensors on the smartphone this is an old diagram but this gives you an idea of the kind of sensors we're talking about um so you know lots of people play with accelerometers and uh also we use the microphone all the time but there's other things like light sensor uh, which could tell if your phone is in your pocket or is out in the open, for example. The other thing about it is that there's loads and loads of data points, and this is some of them. This is not all of them, but you know, the the thing is that you could use all these combined with sensors to do other to to provide um, you know different types of experiences or adapt the experience to to a user. So yeah, imagine the experiences. And this is where we are right now. We, you know, what kind of experiences would you create? So I'm gonna let you play, I'm gonna play a couple of recorded. Now, just a, a little thing. These are tech demos. Uh, you know, this is, this is exactly why we're, uh, you know, we're working together with um, Penny and with James, because this is what happens when you get, um, you know, a technologist to to create a bunch of demos so here's i'll play the first demo and let you listen to it it's record it's pre-recorded so it's not it's not live from my from my phone but i'll explain why and how that would work later play the the audio please martin hello ian it's 1824 welcome to adaptive podcasting the difference between today's podcasting and adaptive podcasting is we can customize, adapt and personalize on the device you are listening on. For example, this text is dynamically being read out by me, your smartphone. You might have noticed I called you by your name. Yes, Ian. That is your name, Ian. Ian, 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 Ian. Ha, 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 ha. Okay, enough fun, you get the picture. There is a number of things I can do in addition to playing audio files. I can jump around audio files, only playing for a short while or adjusting the balance to get the right levels, think of me as a master remixer. I can play with timing too, I can talk over any audio and layer up audio on top of each other like this. And I can talk on top the different music, which is playing in each channel. Even over myself, freaky stuff, eh? I do not know who I am, yet I desperately want self-definition. I am trying to get us to abandon that terminology. I am saying something inconsistent. I am a non-immigrant. I am who I say I am. I am an employer. I am not there. I do not sleep. Not quite for you. How about the same poem with a different backing track? I do not know who I am, yet I desperately want self-definition. I am trying to get us to abandon that terminology. I am saying something inconsistent. I am a non-immigrant. I am who I say I am. I am an employer. I am not there. I do not sleep. There are many more demos available in the default app feed. Have a listen, and have a think about creating your own. It's quite easy, honestly. Details are on bbc.co.uk slash taster for details. Have a restful afternoon. Enjoy the rest of the day. Bye for now. Okay, so I'm um, just going to give you a to, to, there's a lot of things that are going on in that quick demo. I've got one more demo, which is a lot shorter, but uh, it mentioned it says my name, and the reason why it knows my name is because it's my phone, so it um, it can instantly call my name. Um, 
it's we have a speech to text or text to speech so it can say anything you want um the only person who hears that is yourself um it can um it knows what time it is so it, it there's points where it says well the time is obviously wrong when, when you're playing it for us a pre-recorded demo but it would say the exact time it is um it can also layer up audio as it mentioned before and you can do we've done demos of up to i think 320 different um audio objects playing on top of each other uh on some phones but you can definitely do 64 128 without a problem um there's so much stuff happening the the last demo is interesting because what you heard is you heard the the speech which is one uh which is recorded completely deadpan and then you have a background um which is played on top what's sorry, below and so we can easily just switch that out which is what the second one demonstrates um just to give you an idea of the kind of demo so kind of some of the data that's available um, if you could play the second one, Martin. Hello, please. Ian. You have 2,206 contacts in your phone book. Also, your battery is at 35%. So, yo, I don't know what you would do with that, but there was some thoughts about if your battery is low, then don't put so much, um, so much into the podcast, stuff like that, that could be done. So... We could create a different mix each time, almost like a perfect mix. Um, you know, with a bit of work, you can adjust the balance and stuff like that. You can remove objects, for example. So maybe if you hear that it's in a very noisy environment, then you could, um, you know, maybe increase the volume or not increase the volume or re reduce some of the objects, that kind of stuff. Um, so we've also done stuff with locational based uh, radio play, and this is something you could do with the podcast quite easily. So it knows where you are, um, and the the permissions on your phone still are in control. So you could say I'm in this city or I'm in this location, rather than I'm on this exact street, you know. But you could use that to tell different types of stories, and I would urge you to try the futurebroadcast.com um website just to hear an early experiment we did in 2011 um around this um you can do personal choice so in this example which is um which is live um you can control the the commentary balance you know and you could do that in the podcast client itself you know you could actually go right maybe the the phone knows you're a, a watford fan and so automatically switches to more uh, commentary about Watford and more crowd noise and stuff like that. It's those kind of things you could do. Um, also, one of the ones that always gets picked up is you could adjust the how much of the podcast is played based on your commute to work, for example. So if your commute is 24 minutes, then the podcast is 24 minutes long. You know, if it's if it suddenly changes and increases because you're delayed, then the podcast would know um, and then would extend the, the experience. And this is something we've actually built and it does work, scarily enough. So this is a question. This is all very technical and, um, you know, we we want to know what people will make and this is the important part so this is kind of how the app looks right now it looks i'll i'll be honest looks ugly as sin um but it's because we want to demonstrate that this is not a final thing this is not a completed thing we're still in the you know we're we're in that kind of cycle and this is why it's really interesting working with with the rabbit holes team is to try and like you know, to some of that stuff to not just kind of enforce the technology and go, look, this is it. It's like, okay, we haven't really thought about that. We could maybe build that into it, you know, stuff like that. We will release the app on the Google Play Store. Um, if, you, if you're if you asking if it's on iOS, it's not going to be on iOS at this, this iteration. Um, sorry, all you iPhone users. We're going to open source the code base for the application. That's our ultimate aim. This is not about the BBC owning all this data um, and having control of it. We want to open it up and let people just run with it. 
So to create a podcast is quite simple, but you do need to have some development skills. Uh, if if you're a developer that you know what XML is, you probably don't like XML, but I love XML. Um, if you, then you're probably very aware of JSON. We're using XML to describe the actual uh, podcast, and then we're using JSON for the the uh, metadata that you saw in the podcast client. And it's all zipped together in uh, with the audio and a few images, and then you have your podcast. The other important thing to say is that this is yeah, this is a this is a community practice tool. Yeah, we want people to take it apart, embed it into their stuff. Yeah, this is why we want to open source it. We want to see this stuff grow and become a default because right now podcasts are great, but it's being owned by a few companies. And we think that um, what happens when you put it in the hands of, of young people or other people, and that's, I think, more important to us than the podcast being uh, owned by a few companies. So what will you find and make? I'm going to hand over to James. Thank you, Ian. Um, so as you can tell, Ian is a, is a technical person at the BBC. I am a untechnical person at the BBC. My role has always been editorial and, and, and to an extent, creative and thinking about um, uh, how we make programs and what we, we put into them. Um, but obviously, this has been an opportunity to really reflect on uh, my attitude technology and the technology we use in radio and podcast production, and of course, on our relationship with the with the listener. But just to start with technology, it made me realise that I, um, you know, I rather took it for granted. Um, obviously, there is technological innovation in radio and podcasting all the time. Podcasting is itself a form of technological innovation, and we've had things like binaural sound coming in in in, in the last few years into the sort of mainstream of what we do um but i think broadly for a lot of radio makers and podcast makers um the technology of production is a bit like the technology of the book if you're writing a book you're not sitting there thinking about the technology of the book about what well, has the binding going to work what are the possibilities of the typeface you're just writing a book and you're exploring the you know the extraordinary creative possibilities that the book already affords um and that's often how we've done radio production um but this is exciting because it's an opportunity really to think about new technology, how the technology might evolve and how it might change creative practice. Um, and, and more than that, actually, um, it's an opportunity to actually influence the evolution of that technology itself. Because one of the reasons Ian is, is sort of out here is because he and the team want creative input into how they might develop the technology further. So it's exciting for someone like me. It's not just a case of okay, there's a new bit of technology, what can it allow me to do? Um, but it's also, what could this what could this stuff do for me? What's the creative potential of this technology and how might I help its evolution? So that's quite exciting, I think. Um, and I suppose initially there, there are two things that really excite me, and this is, a, this is a slight reiteration of what Ian's been saying, but from someone who's basically less knowledgeable. Um, so with that caveat, I mean, one of the exciting things here is the way that it deconstructs or seems to deconstruct the traditional linear format of radio and podcasting. So, you know, if I think about how I normally make a documentary, I will um, capture a set of audio. I will then craft that audio until I'm happy with it. And then I will fix its form and I will send it to a listener and the listener will, will experience it in that fixed form. Um, but what this affords is the possibility that instead of sending someone a fixed form, uh, I will send them effectively a sort of bag of, of, of audio, a bag of sounds, you know, that I've thought about. It's not just a random bag of sounds, but it is a bag of sounds nonetheless. What, what Ian calls the, the, the objects, the sounds in there are what, what Ian calls objects in this, this phrase, object-based media. And that in some way, the listener is allowed to assemble or reassemble those sounds in a manner that suits them. And every listener can reassemble them in a different way. And that's... I mean, very exciting. It's challenging in a lot of ways, but it's very exciting. And the second key point is that you can use the data inputs on your phone or the platform on which you're, you're listening and reassembling to help with that reassembly. So this isn't about basically us not bothering to do our job as radio producers and just making the listeners do it for us. Um, you want something um, that's going to be, you know, much more interesting and seamless than that. So it might be, uh, those, that data might be about your location, um, your movement, the time of day that you're listening. It will no doubt be informed by your previous habits and your choices. Um, that should all go into how this reassembly might happen. And you want something that is ultimately intuitive and seamless, um, you know, more like play, I think, than construction. Um, so 
imagine listening to a program and now imagine you can go deeper into the aspects that interest you. You can skip over and remove the bits that don't. Uh, you can completely strip out the sound track and recreate your own soundtrack. You can insist on the repetition of important points. You can change the narrative voice. You can have that narrative voice talk to you personally. Um, you know, you can hear more from the people in the documentary that you don't like. Maybe you could link this documentary or this program or the constellation of audio that this program has become with other audio experiences that you've had from elsewhere. And you can be in charge of the way in which they, uh, they can join. Um, and you could do this, say, with hand gestures. You could uh, a flick of your phone to change the subject if you're bored. You might roll the phone over to go deeper into a given subject. Um, you know, use the phone to manipulate your journey through the audio. And of course, just moving the phone around is just one tiny aspect of how the data coming into the phone might be used to manipulate audio. Um, so in that sense, we're no longer <laughs> potentially the makers of documentaries or programs. We're sort of people who produce a constellation of thoughts and ideas and sounds, and we let listeners walk through them at their own pace and according to their own interests, um, falling down the rabbit holes of their own making, which is sort of where our, our title came from. Um, and the other thing I just wanted to show you is um, is a sort of set of the way this can do sound journey. So Martin, if you might take us to a rainforest, please, sonically. <laughs> Now let us play for a little bit. So this is one of the soundscapes from a project called Forest 404 that I was involved in, which was a, a, a drama, it's an ecological thriller, um, written by Bristol's very own utterly brilliant Tim Atak, um, and produced by Bristol's uh, equally brilliant um, Becky Ripley. Um, imagine if you were listening to this on your headphones. It's a wonderful, rich and deep experience. But imagine now if you could move through it as if it were um, a real forest and the sounds would reconfigure themselves around you as if they were coming from real sources. Imagine if you could bend down and hear the earth rumble. Um, imagine if you could listen to the sap in the trees or hear the grass grow. This is a place that could exist 24 seven where the sounds would change according to the time of day and the temperature according to the time of year Night and day will be real in some way in this place, in a way that they never have been before. And you could go further. What other imagined noises could you introduce into this place? How could you link this place to other places in your, in your imagination and in your world? And how would this place that you can move through, that is, a, is both a real and imagined place in some way, how could that link to the real world in which you were genuinely moving through? This is a kind of augmented reality for sound in some way. Um, how would this magic forest blend into the actual city that you were walking through so that somehow this place was half real and half not um it's a, it's a compelling and wonderful thought um and, and those are just sort of two initial reactions to this technology there are i hope lots more um i want to leave you with three very brief final thoughts so in some ways i think this is about changing the hierarchy between the maker of something and the listener of something it's about an exchange of roles and for someone like me it's a bit about giving up control which is sort of nerve-wracking um, you know, but at the same time, it's like, well, how do you do that without sort of losing the whole point of the damn thing? I mean, sometimes people engage with culture exactly because it's been beautifully constructed and really thought through and, and someone has fixed its form in a way that, although fixed, is kind of multivarious and full of meaning. Um, I think to that regard, the biggest challenge here is fiction. How do you take story forms and allow people to make their own stories out of them without in some ways kind of deauthoring them or, or losing, you know, um, losing any meaning? And I suppose finally the challenge is to make sure that we're not just here making something that fulfills the needs of the technology, but that actually fulfills the needs of the audience using the technology. Um, I think you saw that picture of the phone and all the data points around the phone. You, you could really drown in that. And I think it's important to remember, hey, just keep your focus on the audience and the experience of the audience and, and what you might deliver to them. Um, but I'm gonna hand back to, to Penny now to sort of wrap things up. Brilliant. Thanks, James. Um, and also just to say that uh, Rabbit Holes obviously is beautifully aligned with the Forest for Imagination project that you may know of that's now in its seventh year in Bath, co-designed with Andrew Grant, landscape architect, and um, a whole host of creative individuals and organisations. So this kind of exploration is really important. And at the heart of the process is the collaboration with young people so we've been testing ideas out together 
with the expanded performance cohort, um, but we will prioritise co-production with young people going forward. And we want to focus on play, imagination and reflection and how this informs the creative process. So to engage with and deconstruct ideas together. And we're especially interested in how we make these processes visible in the world alongside young people in an authentic, inclusive and creative way. So as Ian said, we're going to invite hacking and uh, democratize the space using sound and time creatively to co-design a kind of distributed and unraveling narrative that can expand over time. Uh, so this is you know, a brilliant synergy between all of our expertise, but we're also very grateful to all of the artists and creatives that have joined the Rabbit Holes team and it's growing. <laughs> so um, maybe I should hand over to Martin now to field the questions. We've got some in the chat. Right. Th thank you very much, all of you. That, that was fantastic. Um, we do have w one question so far from the chat. Everybody else, get them in as soon as you can. Uh, but I'm going to kick off with, with a question from Andrea Dumitrace. I may not be saying that right. I'm sorry. Uh, have you explored what the possibilities could be for accessibility? Uh, with this. Over to Ian. Uh, yes, um, a, a little bit, not not enough, to be honest. Um, I, I think this is this is an interesting one because, you know, we there is okay. So you could um, look at the phone and and go right. Well, this person is using this um, has his, a bunch of accessibility features already enabled and then because of that then you could then reprioritize or change the sound or adjust the pacing or anything like that to um to reflect or to make it easier um, or make it more uh, audible for the person who's listening the question is, is like what what yeah, what features would you look at and then what would you then do is a big question but yes you could do that and that's something that um, we haven't explored enough just to add to that, I mean, in a way the point of this is, is we'd love to hear your thoughts on it we'd love to hear everybody's thoughts on on how this might might work um in that regard i mean for example I mean, it, was, it was a while back now but i was, I was chatting with someone called Rob, robin stewart who um uh, is a person with autism and we were talking about uh certain kinds of sounds you know help and change her brain she likes having certain kinds of sounds when she's concentrating on things she likes actually has quite particular uh needs in terms of how she listens to speech and there's the possibility in this technology that you could have you know you could have a bespoke set of filters that sort of did that for you um in terms of everything you listen to and i think that that's really really interesting that kind of personalization of it I mean, also, just I just want to add one thing that um, another thing that we we haven't really explored, but it's something that you were thinking about is that, you know, based on um, your circumstances at the time, then that would enable features that you would um, that you may not necessarily usually have. So, um, for example, um, if you are in a very, very noisy place, then removing the background um, and just having the speech, um, it could be very powerful, you know, so you could actually hear what's being said, stuff, stuff like that. So um, it's a real blend, but we, as James said, we really need people just to just to try it and, and build stuff and, and see what they come up with, you know, uh, see what works. Absolutely, and that's why we're so invested in working alongside young people, because I think they will bring ideas to the Zoom room that we haven't anticipated, um, and we'll address that question. So good question there. Thank you very much. Uh, so we've got another question here from uh, Rupert Howe. Uh, who asks, um, so high quality crafted podcasts take a huge amount of writing and editing time using tools uh, which are very well developed and which a lot of people are already familiar with. So how can those radio and podcast people, and Rupert says this, not me, perhaps not always the most technological of people, uh, how can those people use creative tools to tell uh, commercially viable stories in a manageable and understandable way? Like what kind of tools exist already to help with this? 
I guess that comes to me. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, this is this is a tricky one. Um, so we do want to make an editor um, for it because yes, you're right. You know, I mean, even when we're talking with young people, then there will be some young people who will will maybe will struggle with um, with the the coded aspect, and also once you start to go into the coding aspect, you kind of like you're quite separated away from the the kind of the bigger idea. So we definitely want to to build some kind of editor to make it uh, a lot easier and a lot quicker to go. I've just made this thing. I can now hear it straight away. Oh, that's not doesn't quite sound right. I'm going to go back and just make these tweaks. Right now, it's quite a long turnaround to do that. But um, one of the one of the main reasons why we're doing this is because we don't want to go. Here's the editor. Um, go use this. What we want actually is we're using all open source uh, software. We're using open, um, all open technology. So we can imagine we build something and then someone else goes, oh, you know what? Um, I could build that into my podcast editing system or into my sound editing system um, because it's really, because all of it's open. It's not like we're, they have to ask for permission. They can just build it. Um, so I think that's where we're heading. So we're not trying to do it all ourselves. You know, we want people to go ahead and just start making these tools. But to do that, we need to demonstrate some of the possibilities and and make it a kind of quite a serious, you know, kind of, oh, this, this is actually more than just a gimmick. There, there's some really amazing examples uh which which we just could not do on a normal podcast right now uh yeah so uh francis bossom asks possibly a simpler question um you talked about young people what what age ranges are you testing with so initially um thanks francis Efran. Um, we're, we're working with the expanded performance cohort initially, and then when we're ready, we're going to open it out to probably, I'm just checking in with Ian here, but probably the kind of 16 to 25 age range initially. But I mean, we, we don't really have boundaries. Ian? No, I, I think we don't, we don't really have any boundaries. Um, I, I, you know, Ultimately, as I said before, it, it should be for everybody, not not just young people, but everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but we we recognise that um, you know people like ourselves have been in the industry for a long while, so we tend to think a certain way. Where when you put it, I mean, I've always had this dream that um, when you put it into um, a bunch of young people, let's say 13, 14, from inner city Bristol, um, they start creating their own um, pirate radio station based on adaptive podcasting. You know, it just be, I just, I, I look forward to that day. You know, I, I think we're kind of, uh, we think of um, media in a certain way and it, uh, you know, young people can help us to understand the possibilities of this, but also can show us um you know that or, or with a combination of, of what we know and what they can what they know you know then what the new rules are in this space yeah totally agree james did you want to add to that one uh, well i suppose i mean basically yes i mean i'm fascinated to see what's what's achievable i suppose what's challenging is that we're asking people to, to get involved in this at quite an early stage when sometimes conceptually it's it's challenging. And also the interface is, you know, and, and I don't mean this really, the interface is, is rudimentary at the minute because, you know, that's the nature of the thing. And ultimately you'd want pe- you'd want to find a way to use the phone and other platforms as an interface into manipulating the audio that was astonishingly intuitive and powerful. And that's a really exciting possibility. Um, you know, but at the moment, in a way that, that that we're having to ask people to come quite a long way to meet us and to see the possibility of this stuff. Um, but yeah, based on my experience of my children, they're they're definitely in a better place than me to so <laughs> adapt to new technology because they're less you know embedded in the old technology. You know, their their brains are more more adaptable to it. I'd I'd also add just uh, one thing that um, you know, 
it's it's very it's very easy to look at that list of like sensors and data and go right this thing's going to do this 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 and i i think what we'll start to see is that you'll start to see stuff which is um so maybe there's you know it's exactly the same as what you currently do when you're making a podcast but the only difference is one thing and that one thing may be um and we've got demos which do this um we work with Salford university with some young people as well um but a bit a little bit older like university age um and they basically did a soundscape and it was based the only thing different about it was that based on the time of day you get a slightly different soundscape but only slightly it wouldn't be completely different if they would just move different elements in or elements out and it's stuff like that that i think will will um will make it a little bit easier for um for for you know production because i you know if you're putting stuff out for a major corporation then you probably want to have complete control over that but you want to change and adapt a couple of things where i think what we need is the um the young people who will just want to just try different things and they'll start to discover rules that work, you know, because um, there's a lot of sensors and a lot of data. Great, thanks. So uh, two sort of uh, linked questions here. Uh, Rupert Howe asks uh, how we can uh, see these open specifications and documentation. And then Mark Jacob asks uh, when there's going to be work out there to explore and are we going to see a, a number of prototypes from you? Okay, I guess I should. <laughs> okay, so the the specification um, is so that I've actually got a presentation on my slide share, which I can share. Uh, I should have shared before. Sorry, Martin. Um, but the specification is based on a W three C specification called Smile S M I L. Um, it's an old standard. It was built into Real Player and QuickTime, um, and it kind of does a lot of what we're talking about. We've just added a couple extra bits for, um, so it works on a phone. So it's completely open already. You could look at it and and right now, you don't even have to you know, ask my permission or anything like that. Um, the JSON is very simple as well. Um, it's just a, um, a metadata file. Um, I've also, I, I realized I should have shared the, the presentation, but if you, you can actually, look at the podcasts because they're on our site you can pull one down unzip it and actually look at it right now um you know anyone that's kind of um yeah it'd be very easy to do and i could easily point you in a direction if needs be what's the second question sorry uh, about um when are we going to see work out there that we can explore uh, are is there going to be a number of prototypes or are you aiming towards a single great piece of work no um so one of the things that we're we're doing is um so you know um the rabbit holes team is definitely um my kind of main focus um but also we have had other people so um i can't remember the person's name his name was andy from cardiff um approached us because he was interested in exploring um the um resizable um or the length of of a podcast and um he's approached us um and we've done some stuff with him already um so yes uh, we also have other companies and corporations uh who are interested but i think what what will end up happening is that they will do stuff which will be a lot safer the point of doing it with rabbit holes is that we really want to push it um i think all the stuff that um Penny and James have talked about like really push it. Like I love the idea of being able to um, listen to a, you know um, a podcast which is about a forest that you're walking through, but you're walking through your your normal environment, and it encourages you to look down and look up and look around and spend the time. You know those kind of things are can be really powerful. Right. Thanks. So that, that leads on to a question which I had actually, which is, you know, all of this technology is fantastic, but how do we make sure that we pay attention to the aesthetics of it and the emotional engagement when you've got something which is so variable 
and which is, you know, it could end up being a, a fancy tech demo. Yes, well, I'll start on that one because interestingly, in the expanded performance cohort, one of my uh, main questions was around, you know, how how we can create an adaptive podcast to distill the essence of sensor experience and create a liminal space where the concrete and the abstract, the real and the imagined coexist. And Tunisia in our um, cohort asked that question around aesthetics um, and Liv asked the question around empathy. So I think that is that is going to be the focus of the next workshop with the group, I think. But James, do you want to add to that? Yes, well, I need to say that, yeah, it's a really good question. And the answer is that you can easily lose sight of that when you're, you know, when you're looking at data point 29 on the phone and working out exactly how the magnetic field detection system on your phone will have, allow you to readapt Tolstoy's War and Peace, you probably, you know, you're probably not in Kansas anymore. Um, so you do have to to sort of maintain your discipline and 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 and, and keep your focus on on the audience. Um, but that's always been true in some sense. I mean, for me, in in my work, I guess it's always been a quest for beauty and meaning, um, and it still is. You know, you've, you leave that focus. Is this is this going to move somebody? Will this allow somebody to understand something? Is this going to help them think about the world or you know, even heal a broken heart? All of those very, very human things that are at the heart of what I, I certainly and many of my colleagues try to do as, as radio and podcast makers are, are still there. Um, and the fact that you potentially have more new and interesting ways of doing it doesn't change you know, the fundamental reason you're doing it in the first place. Yeah, and to add to that, I think um, I'll hand over to you, Ian, but I think as an artist, I think, you know, exploring those ideas around aesthetics and artistic sensibilities together, you know, those habits of mind of artists, but actually how artists live those out daily um, and have conversations about hugely complex ideas, this universe of possibilities, but together and then understanding more deeply together especially in relation to the natural world and especially now Ian sorry did you want to say something no I think you 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 have both said exactly what I was going to say so <laughs> Great. I mean I, can I just one more thing which is related I suppose is we've talked about this as a the extent to which this has um kind of empathetic potential for, for want of a less pompous phrase um so as i say as a, as a traditional radio program maker i'm nervous about the fact that i'm basically soon to be made redundant by this technology and i'm just going to hand it all over to the listener um but what i think is really fascinating about this is the idea that i will build some sort of audio experience that i will then put out into the world and people will take it and will rebuild it in different ways and then they can stop I can listen to your experience of this documentary and you could potentially listen to my experience of this documentary and that the power to communicate between two different people, like the choices you've made, the way you've reconfigured it, the way the sounds work for you, the change in the narrative voice, the structure, the map of your interests. I think that's something very powerfully empathetic about the way that you could both engage. Um, you know, you could take a sort of central point of material, both engage with it in different ways and then share your engagement. That's, I think that's really exciting. Right, thanks. And that, that leads on to another question I had, actually, which is about uh, you know, a lot of what you've been saying has been focused on things from the creator's perspective, but from an audience perspective, what do you see in this? What, what will encourage people to listen, to take part? Well, where, where do you see the, the real pull coming for new audiences? Um, well, I, I could kick off, say, well, look, I think the like it's radio without the boring bits i mean like you know there is just a genuine like you can get you get to listen to more of the stuff you're interested in less of the stuff you're not interested in that's kind of good i think and then also i suppose there's also the the, the um uh the creative satisfaction of of making so there are aspects of production that are very you know like okay change the soundtrack who do you like but you know there are ways of having it being a creative endeavor for the listener as well which are you know which one hopes would be exciting rather than sort of onerous um so i think those are two obvious ways in which um people might engage with it i do at the back of my mind what i don't even worry about it i'm interested in the extent to which also it, we don't want it to become onerous as i say one of the pleasures of of a well-made thing is that someone else has Someone else has done it for you and and you can engage with the magic of, of their work and their decisions. So I think we need to be careful about 
you know, we don't want the equivalent of sending people into the supermarket and trying to choose between 72 different bags of flour. You know, there are, you're just like, oh God, I don't know what, you know, just someone do it for me. Um, so I think there is that danger on some level, but but fundamentally, I hope this is like, this is culture as play. This is listening as play. This is engagement as play. And I think that could be really exciting for the audience. Yeah, well said. And, and Martin, just to, just to be clear that we wouldn't, you wouldn't separate creatives from the rest of the world. I, I personally believe that everybody has creative potential. I don't think I'd do my job otherwise. Um, but actually, you know, um, the, the notion of, as James said, the, the freedom to follow your fascinations. I think that's the strap line of our charity, giving children, young people, but everybody, you know, we want an intergenerational audience engagement here thinking about that notion of self-directed inquiry that they can control that um, immersion they, they can control those possibilities they can have some say in that process so so I think it is about the processes of thinking and learning and being creative as well alongside Ian did you want to add anything um no I've <laughs> I'm I'm very happy with all the answers you gave <laughs> great thanks so uh, one very last question uh, from ABS Ventures. Uh, this sounds amazing, thank you. If I want to try making something myself, is there a way to get started? Can we contact anyone? Will there be an ability to try making demos, et cetera? How do we get going? Yes, so you should contact me. Um, if you are looking to do something commercial, then we can have a talk at least. But um, I think the important thing right now is that we, you know, we're, we're happy to to kind of provide the player um, and for people to just to start making stuff. You know, um, the source code is a is a different thing, but we will open source that um, at some point, uh, probably next year. But um, if you want to integrate it into your systems, then that's something we could talk about. But if you want to just start playing and making, just talk to me. I can send you um the android um apk um and you can just start playing and making great well that that answers that question uh thank you all this has been uh, a wonderful wonderful talk and um really really lucky to have you all here so thank you um and yes so before we go uh next week's talk is part of our future theme season so recently the F studio funded several residents and their collaborators to convene deep conversations about art technology and society conversations that are both hopeful and critically engaged now until early january there will be talks focusing on what has come out of those conversations and there's full details of all of those on our website so next week's talk is by jane gauntlet and it's going to be called past present and future pleasures Jane is collaborating with Cindy Gallup, Ama Josephine Budge, Sarah Bergill, and Rob Eagle on It's Our Pleasure, a multidisciplinary experience of pleasure, community, diversity, activism, and exploration. And you can get news on all of our future talks by following us on at Studio UK, Twitter, or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram, or by subscribing to our newsletter on our website. Don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel. The button is there, I think. Um, give the video a thumbs up. Uh, more subscribers we get, more likes we get, the more we can share stories like this. So please feel free to share this link. A uh, captioned version of this video will be available to watch again shortly after we finish up. Thank you all for watching, and we'll see you all again here. <laughs>